to start. Um, so a warm welcome to you this morning. My name is Kate Atkinson. I'm head of programs at Claw Leadership. I'm a fair skinned woman in my mid forties. Um, I've got just past shoulder length, uh, fair hair, and I've got a blurry background at the moment. I'm sat in my child's bedroom because we don't all have home offices <laughs> in the garden. Um, really pleased to welcome you along to this Q&A session about our courses application this morning. Um, for those of you who want to access captioning, um, we've got a paste, uh, we've got a link pasted in the chat um, to our captioner, Luke, who's providing captions via Skype this morning. Just wanted to provide a, an apology and an update regarding the British Sign Language interpretation. We had a last minute um, issue yesterday, so we are going to provide translation after this event of the recording. So if anybody is wanting to access that, it will be available on our website, on our YouTube channel. So as I say, my name is Kate Atkinson. I'm Head of Programmes at Claw Leadership. Um, and I'm delighted today to um, introduce this Q&A session. The structure of the session today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Claw Leadership to start with. Uh, then I'm going to introduce and give you a bit more information about our courses, which are open for applications currently. I'm going to hand over to two then, two of our alumni, Valerie and Days, who are going to talk a little bit about their experiences on uh, attending a Claw Leadership course and what the impact's been for them subsequently. And then we will open up for questions from the floor. If I can ask you to put your questions in the chat, that will really help us and then we can field them um, accordingly. I'm aware also that some folk have provided questions in advance of the session. So I'm going to do my absolute best to weave in the answers to those questions as we go. But just to say as well and extend um, a welcome and an opportunity, if there are questions following on from this session that you felt haven't been answered or pop in your head tomorrow morning, you can always drop us an email or you can give us a call and we're more than happy to have a side conversation with you either by email or on the telephone or whatever mode of access suits you. So first of all, just to introduce um, the courses and the applications and a bit about Claw Leadership. So for those of you who aren't aware of our work, um, we've been running offering leadership development courses and programmes for over 15 years. Um, we offer a range of different programmes. I would invite you to visit our website anyway to have a look at the range of different programming that is on offer through Claw, Claw Leadership. Um, we're well known for our residential programmes, um, our courses and our fellowship, and it's specifically courses that I'm going to be talking about today. But we also offer a range of short form programming as well. So there are some targeted projects and programmes that we offer. There are online resources and we also offer conferences and, and short form training as well. So there's a broad programme that we offer at Claw Leadership. But the key essence and the key focus of what we're about is about development of leadership in the cultural sector. And it's important to say that for Claw Leadership, we're really talking about change making. So we're not necessarily talking about people who are working in hierarchical structures. You may well be. Um, but we're also talking about people who may be operating as sole traders, freelancers, as artists and individuals working in change and in leadership roles in the cultural sector. And in terms of the art forms and subsectors that we're supporting, it's really broad. So we have participants coming on our programmes from right across the spectrum of art forms, from the performing arts, visual art, from heritage, libraries. So it's a really broad participant base that we're working with. Um, I'm really proud of that and we really welcome the, the mixture of different perspectives from art forms that that, that representation brings. So Nicole, I'm joined by my colleague Nicole in the Claw Leadership team who's going to drive my slide deck today and I will explain the slides as we go. So Nicole, would you be able to start the slide deck for me please? Thank you. If you can just shunt us along the slide, that'd be brilliant. So, as I say, we're open for applications at the moment, and we have two courses which we're taking applications for at the moment. Uh, the first is our Emerging Leaders course, and that is a residential course that is going to be running in the spring of 2022. And I shall talk about both these courses in a moment. 
And the second course that we're open for at the moment is our Leadership Pulse course, which again is delivered mainly through a residential. It's delivered in a modular format. So that means there are two chunks to the residential. As part of that, we also offer individual coaching, which may be delivered face to face as part of the residential, or that might be delivered virtually online or by phone. And then we also offer as part of that course, small group conversations. And these are online sessions, facilitated sessions um, with a subgroup of your cohort to continue the conversations that happen as part of the, of the course. So those are the two courses that we're open for at the moment. We're not open at the moment for our fellowship programme, but that will be coming later on at the back end of the autumn and early in the new year. Now the next slide, please. So firstly, to talk a little bit about emerging, emerging leaders. So this is our course, which is for leaders who are in the earliest stages of their career. So typically that is two to five years experience and with some experience of initiating or managing projects and, and people. So this is really targeted at leaders who are dipping their toes, starting out in leadership or change making and are really curious about developing themselves as leaders and getting more experience and more skills and more knowledge to better equip them as they go forward into their leadership journey. As I've said, we're recruiting at the moment for our spring 2022. And the dates for that course, for the Emerging Leaders course, are the 14th to the 18th of March 2022. And that course will be running at Ashhorn Hill, uh, which is uh, a hotel venue near Leamington Spa. As an overview of the content as part of Emerging Leaders, you can expect to get a really deep reflective um, experience which is enabling you to reflect and learn more about your particular leadership style, your preferences, how you work, what authentic leadership means for you. You can also expect learning around the business of leadership. So some of the key, key, apologies, key skills, um, tools and understanding that is necessary to navigate as um, a cultural sector leader. And then there's also content which is really focused and targeted around your learning and understanding about leading others. And as I've said before, we're not necessarily talking about leadership in a teams or an organizational hierarchical sense. We're also talking about how you're leading in your sphere of practice or your network if you're working as an individual artist or freelance. So that's an overview of the content. Next slide, please, Nicole. And then the second course that we're open for recruitment for at the moment is Leadership Pulse. And this is our what previously was known as our intensive course. So that is for leaders with a minimum of five years. So when you're considering which course to apply to, please do think about where you are at in your leadership journey. If you're just dipping a toe and starting out, then it will be emerging leaders that would be the most um, applicable course for you. Leadership Pulse is really for leaders who've got a minimum of five years and are wanting to go even deeper into their learning and reflection about themselves as leaders and what that means to go to the next stage. Our spring 2022 course dates for Leadership Pulse um, are module one is the 21st to the 25th of March 2022 and module two is the 25th to the 29th of April 2022. And again, this course, Leadership Pulse, is taking place at Ashorn Hill, which is a hotel venue near Leamington Spa. In terms of the content for Leadership Pulse, again, we're really looking at um, different aspects of cultural leadership, different skills, different attributes of leaders, your own personal understanding of what your leadership means for you and how you apply that going forward in your next steps. So there is content that focuses about you learning and reflecting on your own leadership style. So thinking about you, your profile as a leader, how you orientate your leadership in relation to other people um, and what that means for you as an authentic leader. There is content which again focuses on leadership in relation to others. So as I've said previously, we're not necessarily talking about leaders working within an organization. It might be how your leadership 
relates to others in your sphere of practice if you're a freelance or individual artist. There's also content looking at uh, how you kind of manage resources uh, necessary to yourself, your business or your organisation. We look at leadership for change. So what your role is as a leader who's looking to affect change in whatever you, a practice you're working within. And then as I touched upon earlier, there's also supporting extended uh, learning to engage with your cohort, but also to apply your learning when you go back into your context. So as part of Leadership Pulse, we offer um, online or face-to-face -face during the residential individual coaching. And then we offer an online small group conversation, which is about continuing the learning that you've engaged with during your residential course with your cohort in a, in a small subgroup. Nicole. Thank you. In terms of the course finances, um, we offer a different a range of different fee bands for each of the residential courses, which are based upon your um, organisation or if you're a freelance practitioner, um, uh, the size of your operation, if you like. So for emerging leaders for the spring courses, our band day, which is for one to 50 employees, um, the course fee is £600 plus VAT. Band B for 50 plus employees is £800 plus VAT. For Leadership Pulse, um, band A, one to 15 employees is £1,000 plus VAT. Band B, 50, 16 to 50 employees is £1,500 plus VAT. Band C, 51 to 199 employees is £1,800 plus VAT. And band D, which is 200 plus employees, is £2,200 plus VAT. Uh, unsubsidized course rate. So that is for applicants who are applying from an area of work which is not does not sit within the Arts Council England footprint um, is £4,700 for Pulse and £2,300 for emerging leaders. And we do prioritise those who sit within a subsidised um, area of practice. We do also offer a number of bursaries for applicants, recognising the challenge, the financial challenges to those working in the cultural sector. The bursaries are supported by a range of different funders. I'll talk, I'll talk about those in a moment, but um, th there are usually very few um, applicants on each course who are for paying our full fee fund. Uh, Nicole, can I have your next slide, please? Okay, so as I've introduced, um, we have a number of bursaries for 2022. These offer support um, either for the full cost of the fee band that you're applying to or part cost of um, the fee band, and they range from funder to funder. We have a number of sector specific targeted bursaries um, supported by a range of different funders. Um, our website pages have details of all the relevant bursaries for each course. They do vary from course to course. Um, so it's really important that you check the course that you're applying to and whether that whether a bursary that suits you applies to the, the specific course that you're applying. We also have some region specific um, bursaries as well. So for instance, we have Creative Scotland bursaries um, uh, that apply for, for those based in Scotland. Um, we have targeted bursaries within the bursary offer, which are for underrepresented groups. We are particularly keen to hear from applicants who are deaf, disabled, neurodivergent. Um, and we're also particularly keen to hear from black, Asian and ethnically diverse leaders as well. And you'll see that some of the bursaries um, funded by specific funders are also targeted to underrepresented groups as well. We are able to offer a caring support bursary as part of the residential um, programme. We recognise that for some applicants um, coming along on a residential course does present difficulties if you've got caring responsibilities. So we're able to support some of the costs that might be associated with that. And that is a separate um, allocation to um, the bursaries. So you're able to apply for bursary support, but additionally, you can then apply for caring support bursary as well if you're allocated a place. 
And the way that that process works is that we would need uh, an invoice or some sort of re receipt for the nominated costs and you're able to apply up to a threshold for each week of the residential. All of the details of the individual bursaries that we have on offer are included on the website. There's also detailed information about the eligibility criteria for those bursaries, so please do refer to them really, really carefully when you're making your application. Um, if you feel that you don't quite fit the criteria, I would really strongly suggest that you don't try and apply for that particular bursary. It's really important that you make a really strong case within your application for the bursary that you're applying to. Um, the bursaries do apply to the subsidised cost, so that's the fee band that you're applying at. And you're able within your application to apply for up to two bursaries. You don't have to apply for bursary if you don't want to also. You are asked within the application form, you're asked to make your case for why you fit a bursary, how you meet the criteria. Please make that as uh, clear as you're able to and include any relevant information that you think helps us in assessing how you meet that eligibility criteria. And once we have assessed applications, any offers of bursaries are made alongside that offer. So if you apply for a bursary, um, we would expect to offer the bursary alongside your course place. We wouldn't offer you a place that is uh, not does not have a bursary at the point of application. So there shouldn't be any nasty fee shocks if you're um, awarded a place. I'm just going to check the chat because I think there was a question about. Um, there's a question from Flora here about lottery funded cultural activity. What about lottery funded cultural activity that isn't in the Arts Council footprint? I would recommend that depending on the nature of your work, you kind of review what the available bursaries are and what they look like and whether you make the, meet the eligibility criteria for that specific bursary. We do have some support um, for um, those beyond the Arts Council available through Esme Fairburn, but I would really recommend that you chew through the different eligibility criteria to help you make a decision. And if you need a bit more individual advice on that, we're able to do that by phone or by email. Um, there's also a question here from Verity. If you are a freelance sole trader, does Band A subsidised cost apply? Um, yes, it would do. Our bursaries um, apply to depending on the eligibility, the individual eligibility, they would apply to freelance individuals as well as those in organisation. Um, do we, there's a question here from Siema, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name right. Um, do we apply for the bursary within the CLAW application or separately? The bursary section is within the application form. So you make your case as part of your application. So we consider that in the round with the rest of your application. Um, and there's a question here from Kenneth. Can you confirm the eligibility criteria are working in England, normally in the arts museums or library sector? Yes, specifically, but again, I would recommend that you look at the, the range of bursaries because there are some bursaries that are targeted to particular subsectors or areas of practice. Um, Liz is asking a question here. If you don't qualify for bursary, can you still be offered a place? I'm looking at other sources of funding too, as well as the bursary. Yes, you can. You can apply um, and apply for a non-bursary supported place. That's absolutely fine. We do get applicants who are looking, as you've included, um, about who, who are in, in sorry, we do get applicants who are applying for non-bursary supported places, and that's absolutely fine. Um, Kenneth is asking for a clarification. I was not asking a question about bursaries, about eligibility. Um, eligibility for CLAW leadership courses is across all aspects of the cultural sector. It's, so it's not necessarily within um, Arts Council footprint areas. We do accept applications from film, um, from other areas of the, the cultural sector. Um, Ruth is asking a question about whether eligibility is based all on where you live or you work. You can make a case for, or I, I primarily I would say it's where you're working. So basically you need to be applying 
for your own particular work context. So if you're working in Wales, then you would um, you would meet the needs of the the, the Arts Council Wales version. Okay, I'm going to well, I will happy to take more questions as we go, but I'll move us along to the next slide, please, Nicole, if that's okay. Um, okay, so we have. Uh, I'm just going to take one more question actually um, from Andrew. He's just pasted a question about the Arts and Humanities Research Council um, bursary. Um, new for this year, we have got two sets of bursaries, both on emerging leaders and for leadership posts from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and they are targeted at academics. Um, essentially, the criteria uh, for each of those bursaries is dependent on the course that you're applying to. So you need to make a value judgment about where your level of experience fits in terms of that particular course. Um, for academics who are kind of coming with a slightly different kind of breadth of kind of study and, and, and work experience, if you wanted to have a side conversation to help you tease out which course is more relevant, we would be absolutely happy to do that. Um, we're, we're looking at all aspects of your, your experience in that respect. So it might be your academic research experience, but it also might be experience in terms of teaching and it also might be in terms of experience of engaging with the cultural sector through any knowledge exchange or partnership work. So Andrew if you want to have a side conversation about that I'm more than happy to do so. Okay so in terms of how you apply for CLAW leadership course um, you should make sure before you put um, your application in that you've read through all the course information and the criteria in great detail. We also have a guide on online, our essential guide to making your application online. And this has got lots of tips about how to make your application, what we're looking for in, in applications. And there's also some technical guidance about using the portal. Um, we have a British Sign Language version of that document. Um, there's a video of it embedded in our website also as well, just to flag. Before you make your application, you will need to register for an account on the CLAW Leadership website. So you need to make sure you're set up um, and able to access the portal by having an account with us. Um, we do ask that you, unless you want to make your application in an alternative format, that you do submit your application via the portal. Um, we can discuss with individual applicants if they would like to make an application in an alternative format via video or in another, um, in another format. So if you know, for reasons of access, you wish to have a conversation with us about making some adjustments, we're more than happy to do that. Um, in terms of the nominator, this is a key part of your application. So the nominator's role within the application is to provide an endorsement and some additional reflections on you as a leader and to support your application as part of the process. The nominator really needs to be somebody who knows you and your work really, really well. So it might be your line manager, it might be a partner that you've worked with, it might be someone who mentors you, but they really need to know in depth about you, your leadership potential, um, and how the course will benefit you and your leadership journey. Really critical that you get onto your nominator early because the nominator is an essential part of the application and sadly we cannot accept an application without that nomination in. Um, you then complete and submit your application online. The deadline this year is the 20th, for this round, apologies, this round of applications is the 23rd of November at noon. And we are really strict um, uh, about that deadline to help us manage the processing of applications afterwards and to be fair to everybody applying. And then we, just to flag, we have 24 places available on each of the courses. That's our cohort size. So competition is really, really stiff. Just to give you an idea of application volume, um, last application round for courses across both, in total, we had 300 applications. So we get a high number of applications. So it's really critical that you make the base, best case for, for, you, for you in your application, that you follow the questions and answer them, that you include all the information that we're asking for and that you get it in in time. Um, I've just noticed a couple of questions in the chat about applications, so I'm going to take those now. Um, okay. 
uh, question from Siema, what is the criteria of a nominator? There aren't specific criteria about a nominator, but it does need to be somebody who knows you, you and your leadership and your work really, really well. It might be an ex-line manager. It might be someone who line manages you now. It could be, as I say, a partner, a stakeholder that you've worked with closely. Um, it, we wouldn't recommend that you use somebody, um, you know, that you live with. We've been asked that question before. But if you if you're you know working in a partnership in your organisation, it could be your partner or your partner founder. Um, so think about somebody who knows your work really inside out, knows you inside out, and and what your leadership potential is. Stevens asked a question: Do you have to register for an account before you apply? Yes, you do. In order to access the application portal, you do need to register for an account, but it's a pretty straightforward process. You go onto the Claw Leadership um, website and you, you set up an application profile. Uh, and that means you also have the option there to sign up to our mailing list if you want to as well. So yes, you do need to apply for your account before you apply. Um, I'm an actual Chevening British. This is from Isaila. Uh, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'm an actual Chevening British Library Fellow. Can I apply for one of the courses? I am not an employee of the British, I assume British BL means British Library, but they are willing to know the cost of the courses and to know if I am eligible. I think, Zella, we might need to take that question offline on us. I'm not clear from the question whether you are, whereabouts you're based and kind of, you know, what, what you might be wanting to apply for. So that might be a question to take offline with us individually. Julie is asking, does a nominator have to be linked to your current role? Not necessarily. Um, it could be somebody you've worked with previously in another organisation. I would say they do need to know, have an up-to-date perspective on you as a leader, what your leadership potential might be. So not necessarily from you be a previous role. Um, uh, Alice is saying, have to be your line manager or ex line manager, or maybe someone, I think I've just asked, answered that. Um, it can be somebody that worked with previously. Um, Verity is saying, How do you have the nominator details? I can't see where to do this. You should, as you walk through the application form, the nominator section is the first section that you encounter because we know that folks need to get onto this earlier. So Verity, if there are any, if you're having any technical issues with the application form, please do let us know in a side conversation, we can kind of help you walk through that. Um, but it should be the first section that you come across. Is a previous, Laura's asking, is a previous CLAW leadership participant a good nominator? Um, yes, can be. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's been on a CLAW course previously. Um, but it certainly means that they have an understanding of kind of what the course entails and what that course could potentially bring to you. So, yes. Um, how do you give, Lydia's asking, how do you give equal consideration to freelancers, given that their counterparts in organisations are likely to have much more support in developing an application from experienced senior colleagues? Lydia, what I would say is that we are, we're, it's not a funding application in, in that sort of traditional sense, we're really interested in your individual voice coming through in the application form. We're not looking for pros in how you craft your application for, we're looking for honest and frank responses to the questions. So think about who you are as a leader and what that potential might bring for you uh, and speak in your honest, um, authentic voice through the application form. We do, um, as part of the cohort, we do try and get a balance of freelancers represent, re represented within the cohort. So we and we do appreciate that people come with different experiences of writing applications as well. So, as I said, we're not looking for pros. We're looking for your voice and an understanding of your leadership potential and what that means to you. Um, CM is asking how the nominator submits their piece. Um, the application system connects up with your nominator. You put the details in, you give us their email address, and they are then emailed the nomination form and asked to submit it via the portal. So the application system will talk to your nominator. Um, you won't see the nomination when it comes in. Um, we will see it and be able to assess it, but they, they complete that separately. 
Okay, I'm going to move us along because Nicole is nudging me on time. So, Nicole. Um, application tips, um, and I've talked a little bit about some of these already. Really critical that you read our essential guide to making your application online. Um, there's a PDF. Uh, version on the website and there's also I've said there's a, a British Sign Language version of that as well that gives you more information detail about uh, what we're looking for in the answers it lists the questions that we're asking and gives you some insight into what we're, we're trying to elicit from you from your application but as I said we're really interested in uh, leaders who are reflective who are prepared to kind of um, you know, be really deep, deeply reflective in their learning. They're curious. They want to make change in what area of practice. Uh, and that's kind of what we're really trying to, to get to with the application questions. In terms of choosing um, your nominator, I've spoke a little bit about this already. It's a key assessed part of the application form. So do get onto your nominator good and early. From experience, we get a lot of people whose nominators leave it to the very, very last minute and it can be really stressful for the applicant. So make sure that you are approaching a nominator who you know is able to um, put time and in good time to put their nomination in um, and that you feel knows your work really, really well. Um, and if necessary, you do need to nudge that person along to get that submitted because we cannot accept your application without the nomination. As I said before, we're really looking for um, leaders who can be really honest and brave about their answers. You know, we're, we're not looking for fully fledged leaders, but the courses are really about um, taking your leadership to the next level. So we're not expecting you to have all the answers at the moment. We're expecting you to be asking questions of yourself. We are looking for leaders who are open to learning. That's a really key part of of the courses is to, to really dig into new areas to challenge yourself um, to kind of ask questions of yourself in different areas and to drive your you and your personal you know cultural sector leadership forward and as I said before um, in that to that earlier question we're asking you to write as yourself so don't pretend to be someone that you're not answering your authentic voice what are the really important questions about you and your development at the moment what are you looking to achieve what change are you looking to make in the, in the world? Okay, Nicole. Um, timeline. Um, the application timeline for this round deadline is noon on the 23rd of November. And we, I'm afraid we can't um, offer, uh, we can't accept late applications. Um, following that, the applications, we have an assessor pool. So they are double assessed, um, blind assessed. And then we um, do a moderation process where we're cross-checking how that assessment process has worked. And then we will uh, pull together the final cohort. Outcomes, we are aiming to get decisions back to applicants the week commencing the 20th of December. So you will know the outcome of your application before Christmas. Um, there are 24 places we're able to allocate to each course. We can provide support for applicants um, who need who feel like they need a little bit of a, additional support to complete the application form. And we can accept applications in alternative formats if, if that meets your needs. Have a conversation with us about what your needs are and how we can make adjustments to support them. But we can accept um, where, where necessary applications in different formats. Um, Regrettably, we aren't able to provide individual feedback. And I know that this is a, a source of great frustration um, for every application round. To explain, we are a very, very small team. There are four of us in the programmes team. So it's we're teeny tiny. And in terms of the volume applications, as I said last time, uh, course round, we had 300 applications. So with regret, we're not able to offer individual advice. Um, I'd say some of the key areas where um, we noticed that applications could be improved are around uh, being open and reflective. I've talked a little bit about this on the previous slide, but being open and reflective to really um, speaking within your application in an authentic voice, to really articulate what your potential, you feel your potential is. So be brave and honest about where you think you've got gaps or learning or where you want to, to kind of develop yourself. And also be brave and honest about what the changes that you'd like to see. Um, and just a quick note in terms of application timeline, the fellowship applications 
um, are not open at the moment. So our Chlorae team, which is our next fellowship cohort, who will start in 2022, will be opening back end of this year or early January 2022. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any questions. Um, Stephen's asking question, what if you did leadership before but had a bit of a negative experience, so maybe a bit anxious of going back into it? Um, I'm not sure. Stephen, maybe you could just clarify what, what you, just clarify a little bit more in the chat and that will help me steer an answer towards you. Um, um, yeah, if you just clarify and then I'll, I'll see whether I can answer that one. Um, Kate's asking, after the spring dates, do you know when the next round of courses will be scheduled for next year? At the moment, no. Um, we have, obviously we're navigating the world of COVID as is everybody. So we're kind of watching and waiting and we will need to schedule um, in response to that. And obviously the rest of the programme as well as we're able to land some previous programming which we weren't able to deliver through the pandemic. So at the moment, I can't say. Um, uh, Catherine's asking, would you mind just saying something about the fellowship so we understand the difference? Um, the, I think I would, I would steer you towards having a look at our website to find out more in detail about the fellowship. But essentially, the fellowship is a more elongated, intensive um, programme that we offer. And it's really to, to it's, uh, it offers highly specialised, individually tailored support. So there's lots of key components, but they're really individually tailored. It doesn't just include the residentials. There's lots of really bespoke supports. I would signpost you to the website for more information about the fellowship. Julie's asking, is it up to us to justify the area that we work in is a suitable area? I'm a bit uncertain if I qualify. Julie, it might be worth having a side conversation if you're a little um, unclear about whether you qualify or not. I think that would, I would be my suggestion. And then we can give you some steer as to what, what you might want to include within the application. Stephen saying, I did a leadership role before, but it didn't go well. I think what I meant was if you do the course and then don't realise it's for you. Um, well, that's a, that's kind of up to you. If you were coming on the course, you do the course and then you go away and work back in a leadership context and, and don't think that leadership is for you. That's absolutely your call. We will work with you within a residential to explore what your leadership potential is and to really tease out some of what you as a, you know, who you are as a leader, what that means authentically for you. If in a future employment context, you change direction, change career, that's entirely up to you. Um, yeah. Um, OK, I'm going to jump now. We'll take some more questions from the chat in a wee while, but what I'm really keen to hear from um, our course alumni. So I'm going to hand over firstly, if I'm able to. Nicole, could you stop sharing? Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Days Hale. Uh, and Days is someone who's been previously on an emerging leaders course with us. So Days, would you like to just share a little bit about your experience um, and maybe talk, share a little bit about what the impact of the course has had for you? Um, great. Hello, um, I'm Days Hell. I'm a freelance independent producer. Um, I'm a, a white person with uh, fluffy pink hair and I'm wearing a black roll neck and a black fisherman beanie today. Um, I did Emerging Leaders in 2019, no, 2020, <laughs> um, just before the pandemic. That was um, a great time. Um, uh, and yeah, so I did Emerging Leaders in 2020, February 2020. Um, I found the residential element of the course really, really helpful, it allows you to focus and also allows you to sort of switch off completely from outside noise, especially me as a freelancer, that's sometimes quite difficult. So being able to like go to a whole separate place um, and uh, you're very well looked after as well, which is um, very nice. Um, it was really excellent for me to spend time with people from the culture sector who maybe don't have a crossover with my particular like field, um, who are also experiencing different sort of problems and paths and ambitions and that operate in a completely different structure to me. I found the like 
peer element of that really wonderful and we're still in a like active whatsapp chat today like we meet up regularly we all live across the country but we all like try and see each other as much as possible um people had a lot of um revelations about themselves um on emerging leaders uh learning like about their communication and leadership style how that works and also that there are many models of leadership there's no one way that leadership particularly has to work there's no formula to that um, but also how leadership relates to management um, as a lot of people have a lot of good vision but they're not always it's not always paired with excellent management and so I found that like the coaching techniques and the um, communication models um, that we learned were a really great sort of um, uh, foundation for uh, how to pair those together. Um, as I said, a lot of people had like big revelations about themselves, but also about like their colleagues that weren't in the room. Um, some people decided that they need an entire career change <laughs> um, uh, or to no, or, or sort of realise that there was things that they needed to negotiate in their workplace in order to develop themselves. Um, I personally found our session, we had a session with um, someone called Miles Harrison who gave a, a session on business models and I personally found that extremely helpful, especially um, thinking about like where I am now in, in going to do my own business. Um, and I've continued to reapply that into my everyday um, sort of work, but also like facilitation with other people. Um, I think my experience of, of emerging leaders has made me very aware of how to be, what it, it, it gave me the tools to figure out how, that, how I wanted to lead and how, to, how I wanted to lead in an ethical way. Um, but also I feel a lot more prepared for entering uh, negotiation or like as a freelancer who often enters like a lot of different situations. Um, I felt, I feel a lot more prepared for like, oh, okay, well, I need to adapt my leadership style for this scenario versus another scenario, but also um, I can identify the leadership style that's in place in uh, if I'm going into somewhere where you know I'm not the, the leader in the room necessarily um, or I'm working with another organization so um, I feel a lot more prepared for, for just being able to like negotiate that without there being like frustrations or um, uh, disagreements or where there are disagreements being able to navigate that in a like healthy way um, so I think yeah that was my uh, experience of, of, of emerging leaders and yeah I came away from it feeling really like full and like um, you know not not all of it was stuff that I like um, could get my head around at that time but like being given the space to like process and be with other people and the peer element of it is is extremely valuable. Thanks very much, Days. And bringing in Valerie, Sin Valerie Sinwa, um, Valerie, would you share a little bit about your experience as well, please? You were on Leadership Pulse. Sure, thank you. So I'm Valerie Sinwa and I'm the uh, CEO of Tomato Theatre Company. Um, and I did uh, the Leadership Pulse course in 2019. Um, that was um, basically the first year that they set the Pulse programme up. Prior to that, there was just the intensive and I'd always been attracted to, to wanting to do the intensive course, but um, just didn't feel I could spare two full weeks away from kind of life and childcare and, and running a small company and so on. So when the pulse came along, I kind of jumped at it and thought this is probably the time for me to do this. Um, I, I basically applied because I felt that even though I'd, I'd been in a kind of leadership role um, for a number of years, I struggled a little bit with what that really meant and what wanted to kind of, kind of unpick that a little bit. A little bit. And also, I think for a lot of people in the sector, we kind of learn our skills, our leadership skills, kind of on the job. And as we go along, there's no kind of formal training or formalized kind of routes through to understand all the different sides of leadership. So I was really keen to kind of 
you know, just understand the full breadth of what, you know, the, the different areas we need to work in and get a real sort of sense of how to do, what does the kind of different ways of doing different things and learn from others in, in doing that. And I was really keen to kind of widen my networks. I was really keen, I think what was really appealing about CLAW is that it, it spans across different art forms and disciplines. So on the, on the course that I did, the cohort was made up of people from the heritage sectors, uh, visual arts, uh, other parts of performing arts, uh, libraries and so on. And I think that's a really good mix of people to kind of learn from and, and kind of engage with and learn how people do things kind of differently, really. Um, so, so like Dave said, yeah, I found the residential part a really good way to be able to get away from the day job and kind of just really immerse yourself in what you're doing. It was challenging, though, because, um, yeah, I think we're all very, very busy people and even just sparing sort of three or four days away from the day job is quite, quite challenging. And the course itself is very, very intensive. So you do have to kind of really, be really engage with it and, and do lots of homework in between and come fully, fully prepared to kind of just, you know, immerse yourself and engage and, and, and give as much as you can. I think you get out more if you can put more in. Um, and it's very, very comprehensive. So you do really go deep into lots of different areas, um, which can be a little bit sort of uh, mind exploding at times. You do feel a little bit like you're, you know, you're, you're completely drained at the end of each day. But yeah, it's a, it's a really kind of immersive, intensive experience. Um, in terms of the impact um, going, going forward from there, I mean, I, I think as, as Dave was saying, one of the really valuable things about it is about the the fact that everyone there is really generous with their experience and their expertise and there's a real sort of sense of collegiateness about it that you kind of people put in there you know they're quite open and vulnerable and open to kind of saying where they are in their lives and in their careers and I think from that you learn a lot from each other um, and like Dave's I have now have a, a really strong kind of network of connections and allies that I can go to and I think we're all still in touch and we all kind of support each other we haven't met up as much as we'd like to in the pandemic world um, but we have kind of connect, connected through WhatsApp and have a group and we talk and, and continue to share experiences and so on and I think the whole focus of CLAW on being of not being having a prescribed sense of what leader what the term leader means is really really important I, like I said previously I've struggled with that as a term and I think it allowed me to kind of have a real sense of who I am as a leader who I want to be as a leader rather than having a notion in my head of what a leader should be. I think about what I can do in my own way and in my own style. Um, so that's what I've taken away. Thanks so much both to Valerie and to Dace for sharing their experiences. I think it really, it really helps sort of bring to life what um, the experience of, of coming on a course uh, brings both for you as you, as you attend a course, but also the impact longer term. Because I think uh, as someone who went on a CLAW course, uh, over 10 years ago now I think it's safe to say the learning sort of percolates and bubbles and there'll be different bits that pop up at different times um, in your career but it really does sit with you and kind of shapes where you go so thank you both very very much for sharing your experiences. Um, we have 10 minutes more left to this session so I am hope, happy to take more questions from the chat uh, and also there's a couple of questions that I know we haven't yet covered off from those who submitted them um, in advance. Um, so, does anybody have any uh, other further questions at this stage in the chat and we'll take those. Okay, I can't see at the moment. So I'm gonna go to some of the ones that were submitted in advance. Um, there was a question about whether it's possible to apply for both courses. We wouldn't recommend that particularly. I think what really what you need to do is identify where your experience level sits for either course. There is a distinction for emerging leaders is really about kind of your first foray, your first steps into cultural sector leadership and leadership pulses for those applicants who already have some existing leadership experience and want to work from that platform. So as Valerie's already talked about, Leadership Pulse is a really deep dive. It's more, there's more content. It's a longer course. So it's a much deeper dive where emerging leaders is more of that first step, that first foray into leadership. As Days has shared, um, their journey onwards from emerging leaders is that first potential being explored and moving forward from there. So um, I hope that clarifies. Um, just going back on the chat. Um, Siema, oh, Siema has asked the question about 
uh, if you apply for the art from bursary, but your job title is not curator, but you do cur curatorial work, it is, yes, it is still okay to apply if you're doing curatorial work. There is a section where in the application form, or it asks you about your professional experience and you're able to talk about your work as a whole within that section. So if your job title isn't, you know, doesn't necessarily talk about that, but the, the body of what you're doing is a, in your role is, then that's, you're able to, um, to articulate that within the application form. Um, do people usually get accepted first time? Oh, wow. I think there's no kind of rhyme or reason really to that. I think um, it just depends on the nature of, of the application that an applicant puts in, what they include within the application. And also if you like, because you are uh, going into an applicant pool of potentially, as I said last time, there was 300 applications. It really, really varies. There are some folk who might apply first time and get accepted. There are others who may have applied a, a couple of times and haven't been accepted. So I wouldn't say that there is a hard and fast rule to that. Um, uh, Stephen, I haven't read your question correctly. Apologies. If you don't accept it first time, can you reapply? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. We, um, it's not like you have only one go. Um, and if you don't get accepted, you don't get a second chance. You are absolutely able to put more than one application into us. Um, okay. Um, any further questions? Um, we did have a question submitted um, about the session that we ran. We ran an earlier Q&A for Black, Asian and ethnically diverse cultural sector leaders. Um, that happened a, a, a week or two, week or two um, ago. Somebody has asked um, in advance of the session whether that session was recorded. We didn't record that session. It was a safe space for leaders of colours to be able to ask um, questions in that particular context. Um, and it was delivered by members of our team uh, who are people of colour. So if there's any applicants who wish to have a side conversation with uh, members of our team, specifically coming from that representative group, who would like to be able to ask um, a person of colour on our team some specific questions are absolutely welcome to do that and we can connect you up with a member of the team to do so but we didn't record that session because it was a safe space and I hope that the reasons for that are are um, understandable if you like. Um, there's some more questions pinging up. What will happen if changing COVID-19 related regulations means a residential course is not possible especially if you have had to pay fees if you haven't received a bursary? Yes, the wonderful world of COVID. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, to explain, we we are watching and waiting and assessing the COVID landscape all the time. For We are just in the midst of delivering some courses at the moment. And what we have offered this time around has been a blended um, approach to delivery. So we are operating face-to-face -face at our venue at the moment, but we've also put facilities in place to offer the option for participants and or contributors to take part via Zoom. So there's a combination of both those experiences going on for that one cohort. Um, we would be looking at um, whether the situation with COVID remains the same in spring 2022 uh, and making a judgment call around then about whether to offer a blended approach or whether we will need to kind of pause and wait until if we go into another lockdown pause but we will be communication with a cohort about that. And we're very much um, in communication with individual members of that cohort about what their preferences are as well. If there's particular reasons or as a choice that you don't want to attend in person, then we would look at an alternative way of you attending. Um, and the cohorts that we've worked with this term, um, there has been differences in attitudes towards being in space together and we recognize that and want to kind of work with that there's also different circumstances some people may have particular health reasons or or, or caring responsibilities where they're not able to be in the space with us uh, because of covid so i would say it's watch and wait we're working within government guidelines and we're also working within the needs uh, and the preferences of the cohort and the contributors as well um how do we organise a side conversation? You can, if you want to organise a side conversation with us to follow up on anything that we've touched upon today or any specific questions, you can drop an email to us uh, on our courses email address. So it's courses at clawleadership.org. 
um, member of the team will pick that up and we can either field it to a, an individual colleague if it needs addressing individually with a, somebody in spe specific or we will pick it up um, and, and come back to you so you're able to contact us by email. Um, if you're applying seeking a bursary but don't get it can you still be offered a place we would we would consider your application in the round so if you are applying for a specific bursary um, you have the option to apply for two so if you're offered a place we would try and offer you one of the options that you've applied for um, I kind of sort of said before we wouldn't um, you wouldn't have any nasty surprises in terms of the fee um, we would try and allocate you the bursary that you've applied to as part of your place um, what tips do you have for us to convince our employer to let us take time away from work for the residential? CM has asked that one. That's a million dollar question, I think. I think the, the case that you're making is really about explaining the potential for you as a leader and how that impact will work within a work context. Um, we do appreciate it's really tough for a lot of organisations at the moment. Capacity is stretched, resources are stretched. Um, so, you know, you, we understand and to a certain extent we're in the same boat, we're a small team as well. Things are really, really stretched for cultural sector workers at the moment and we do appreciate that. I think it's really about explaining what the impact and what the changes that happens for individuals who come on the course and therefore what the impact will be for your employer. Um, I think that would be what would be my main tips in terms of convincing an employer. Um, Azela, who has asked, who can I reach? out to know more about case i'm i am wandering the fellowship at the british library apologies azella i don't quite understand your question if it's a question about how do you follow up with a colleague you can drop us an email and we'd certainly be happy to have a conversation about that or, or do post something in the chat um if that's not the question you're asking i'm sorry i'm not quite fully understanding what you've asked um does the nominator see your application no, the nominator, the way that the process works is that the, the nominator is completed as a side um, part of your application. You won't see the nomination and they won't see your application. Obviously, they do need to know about you as a leader to be able to provide a nomination, but the two don't see each other. When we assess your application, we will see it as, a, as, a, as an entire entity, but the two are separate. Um, if an applicant has specific access requirements that might impact on their experience, is there space to make that clear in the application? Yes, we do understand that leadership journeys are different for different particular groups. Um, so you, you, you explain what your particular journey is, your experiences within the, the questions that are asked within the form. And you are able to explain, if you wish to, what your particular life experiences are and how they relate to your, your cultural sector, cultural leadership journey. Um, and as I say, if you want a bit of individually tailored advice about how you complete the application form or if you want to make it in an alternative format, you are able to do so. Just contact us. We have one minute left. So I am just going to take one more and then I we will need to wrap up this session. So Anita has asked, I understand the course covers some business finance learning. Can you speak more about that? Yes. Um, typically, we will have sessions that look at strategic planning. So it's looking at how you work strategically as a cultural leader and what the benefits and impact are around that. We also have sessions that are around finance, which we've seen is quite a key area for cultural sector leaders um, and learning. So that is a, a session that is included on both courses. So we've reached 11 o'clock. Um, so I now need to thank you all very much for coming along today um, and giving us really rich conversation about the course applications. Specific thanks to Valerie and to Days for sharing their experiences. Thank you so much for giving your time today to talk to this group of people and to share the impact of the Claudineship courses for you. Please do follow up with us if there are side conversations or additional questions. We're more than happy to field them as a team. Um, but good luck with your application. We look forward to seeing some of your applications coming in. And if we can be of more help, please do come back to us. It's been lovely to see you all today. Lovely to talk to you um, and good luck with it all. Thank you.